the two didactic the two didactic race memoirs I'll discuss today are Valerie Carr's See No Stranger, A Memoir and Manifesto of Revolutionary Love, and Simranjit Singh's The Light Give, How Sick Wisdom Can Transform Your Life. Carr and Singh write in the didactic race memoir genre because it allows them to articulate sick approaches to empathy, love, and forgiveness, while, quote, making visible a community that has remained unseen for far too long, end quote. These activists write in response to hate crimes against Sikhs, uh, explicitly naming and historicizing violences which precipitated from having been rendered as terrorists in the wake of 9-11. Running counter to the figure of the terrorist, Kar and Singh refigure the Sikh as a self-help guru, a righteous and peaceful figure who poses no threat to the Christian secular state, while offering Sikhs and non-Sikhs alike anti-racist practices of spiritual self-cultivation. While it would be easy to dismiss these texts as neoliberal, orientalist, and politically ineffectual, or what Meliska uh, Fruskeshart uh, has recently called literature of white liberalism, I read these texts as evidence of a post-secular form of sick American model minority racialization, what I call religio uh, racialization. Mm -hmm. Before diving into the works of Carr and Singh uh, to study um, this, I wish first to discuss how religion subtends what we might understand as racialization through racial performance in the US, to get at this, I'll briefly explain the history of the model minority that formed Asian American racialization and its connections to the anthropological discourse on honor. Um, in the now classic essay, The Racial Triangulation of Asian Americans, uh, Claire Jean Kim observes how the figure of the model minority is pitted against other minorities, particularly Black Americans, to reproduce racist rhetoric and policy in the US. Kim historicizes the model minority myth, asserting that the model minority was first articulated in William Peterson's 1966 New York Times article, Success Story Asian American Style, or I mean Japanese American Style. In this short piece, Peterson attributes Japanese American economic success to, to, to their Tokugawa values, such as uh, uh, diligence, frugality, and an orientation toward achievement, comparing these values to the American Protestant ethic. Such an observation follows the logic of Robert N. Bella's well-cited 1957 history of Japan Tokugawa religion, the values of pre-industrial Japan. Bella's work frames the, uh, the development of Japan from a semi-feudal society to a modern industrial society and global power, attributing a seemingly smooth economic transition to individual investments in the Tokugawa religion. Norman Bell, a reviewer of this work, compares it to Max Weber's study of uh, the Protestant ethic and the rise of industrial capitalism, Though Bell criticizes Bella's singular focus on religion as a structuring determinant, the rhetorical move to use religion as a locus of comparison to understand economic success around the 60s is consistent. Religious reasoning thus becomes a way of rendering individuals responsible for social structures. The Japanese American model minority was considered a good capitalist subject in part, of their, in part because of their religious ideals. The relationship between spirituality and the model minority extends beyond the Japanese diaspora, Kim also cites Lawrence Harrison's use of the term Confucian Americans to describe Japanese, Chinese, and Korean immigrants in his book, Who Prospers? How Cultural Values Shape Economic and Political Success. The category of Asian in Kim's study does not include South Asians, though historian Vijay Prashad and others address this gap. In The Karma of Brown Folk, Prashad, like Kim, addresses the ways model minority subjectivities mobilized against Black Americans in an attempt to appeal to his South Asian diasporic community. Uh, Prashad observes Orientalist notions of South Asian spirituality working in tandem with their designation as model minorities in popular media following the 1965 Immigration Act. In his conclusion, Prashad explains that Desi's, uh, that quote, Desi's commitment to, the, uh, re to reject the model minority thesis and to abjure the idea that Desi's are essentially spiritual is part of the sacrifice of class privilege afforded by white supremacy. Prashad essentially urges Desi's to resist Orientalist assumptions of their spirituality and their social positioning as model minorities in the same breath. It becomes clear that the image of model minority subjectivity is informed in part by views of East and South Asian spirituality, but how might honor figure into this? In a 2019 article published in the Journal of Christian Higher Education of all places, Grace Eng argues that as colleges seek to become more diverse, educators need to understand the cultural dynamics that affect Asian American students. For Eng and others, Confucian values of honor and shame remain cultural aspects of Asian American communities. Eng asserts because Asian Americans' academic achievements may perpetuate the model minority myth, understanding the underlying pressures and cultural factors that these students face can benefit educators who desire to help these students have a greater sense of well-being. 
uh, end quote. Eng suggests that the model minority myth is reproduced by a cultural evaluation of achievement, one which she attributes to Confucianism, where the model minority myth is framed as an external pressure put on Asian Americans by the dominant culture. Honor is a cultural value with roots in what has been considered uh, both a philosophical and a faith tradition. The relationship between honor, religion, and model minority appears straightforward. Model minority subjectivity is informed by a commitment to honor, which is rendered as a religio-cultural value. Honor differently informs South Asian and Middle Eastern racialization. In her study of the global discourse of honor killing, Inderpal Graywall notes that the praxis is generally uh, referred to as a crime of culture. She explains that its depiction and spectacularization keeps us attached to an extent to the anthropological notion of honor societies. She argues uh, that the mediated notion of honor killings works uh, because of its presumed connection to an anthropological real as the foundation upon which culture of distance others can be produced as knowledge. She explains that the concept of honor is used to suggest the cause of a crime and instantiates a particular image of the criminal, namely a Middle Eastern or South Asian man. This would suggest, as Guy through Spivak famously asserts elsewhere, a logic of white men saving brown women from brown men is at play. Graywall uh, posits uh, that eradicating the phenomena of honor killings will not work without challenging the existence of honor as a problem in the post-colonial history of the production of culture. Following Graywall, I wish to put pressure on the concept of honor, thinking instead with a culturally specific term, is it, which is often translated as honor. In the reading of British Sikh diasporic women's memoirs, Shweta Kushal and Evangeline Manikam assert that um, uh, that izzat means more than honor as it refers to an amalgam of honor, dignity, prestige, and social position. The authors explain that on the one hand, izzat describes an individual's self-respect, how a person sees himself and his relative value in society, but at the same time, measures of izzat also dictate the extent to which society accepts a person's self-worth and help determine the level of status and material benefit which it accords him as a result. They go on to explain that is as a cruise to the family as a group, not just to individual males within it. Their advancement of uh, the advancement of their corporate is is one of the most important goals which South Asian families set themselves, as is the case with Asian Americans to whom Confu the Confucian notion of honor informs their investment in achievement. For South Asian diasporic subjects, is a informs an investment in achievement informed by religious cultural circumstances within their communities. At a Sikh temple, for example, you'll not hear uh, parents telling their children to be good little model minorities. They would instead insist that their children's achievements reflect on the family's is that is that as a religi religio cultural value structure might be seen therefore as a post secular iteration of model minority. Though not all Asian Americans are religious, Sikh American identity is itself an ethno religious construction that is informed by an untidy mutual implication of Sikhi or Sikhism in Punjabi or Punjabi culture. This mutual imprecation informs how in the respective memoirs Simranjit Singh and Valerie Carr perform Sikh model minority subjectivities. To be clear, I use the verb perform with Judith Butler's notion of gender performativity in mind. Though racial and gender performance are not entirely the same, they bear similarities strong enough to justify deploying performativity here. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that performativity uh, fully determines race, just that race is articulated in part through performance. With regard to Butler, uh, with regard to gender, uh, Butler explains that femininity and masculinity function not as set facts, but as effects available only if staged. She explains, quote, gender is not passively scripted on the body, and neither is it determined by nature, language, the symbolic, or the overwhelming history of patriarchy. Gender is what is put on, invariably under constraint daily and incessantly with anxiety and pleasure, but this continuous act is often mistaken for natural or linguistic given, end quote. In her book, Passing for Perfect, College Imposters and Other Model Minorities, Erin Kunin asserts that one is not born, but rather becomes a model minority, which she understands to be the social identity that, that American society demands of the biologically Asian subject. She explains that the model minority is, ident is quote, identity as a compelling illusion, end quote, a folding of first the Japanese, then the Chinese, then East Asians, then South Asians, and then some Southeast Asians, and sometimes all Asians in America, into a single character type. Citing literary critic Min Song, Nin, asserts that expectations are certainly ascribed, but also require active identification to be made fully into a set of ideas with material meaning, meanings in one's life. She goes on to say uh, that much as heteronormativity laminates gender onto sex, dominant American and ethnic cultures consort in naturalizing Asian and model minority as one. Such a frame makes it difficult for Asian American subjects to fail at performing model minority subjectivity without risking being recognizable as Asian in the first place, even within their own communities. 
Indeed, borrowing from Lauren Berlant's work on genre, Nin understands small minority performance to adhere to the logic of genre con a generic convention. She explains, quote, genre organizes an uh, ongoing relationship between the subject, her historical material circumstances, and her patterns of interpretation and response, end quote. Genres also uh, organize conventions about what might uh, be hoped for explicitly or secretly, and the bargains that can be made with life. Nin goes on to say that uh, to live in a world that a genre has built is to ration one's desires by its math and to choose one's path by its formulas for an emotionally satisfying ending. To inhabit a genre with an intimate public is therefore not only to share a frame of reference, but to share the very logic that governs what it is to have a life. For six, is it as a value system functions as one of the genres through which model minority subjectivity is performed. So how does Sikhism is in work in tandem with Christian sentimentalism to govern model minority subjectivity in See No Stranger in the Light We Give, the two memoirs I plan to talk about briefly. Um, neither text explicitly names is that though neither uh, narrator confesses their biases or ethical failings in detail. Both narrators are cast largely as a virtuous victims and survivors of racism with flawless or otherwise redeemable relationships with their families. Their moral failures fall nothing short of benevolence. They are benign confessions, if one could even call them confessions. Simranjit Singh frames his uh, worst moral failings as his difficulty forgiving Wade Michael Page, the man responsible for the Oak, Tree Oak Creek Temple massacre in Wisconsin, and uh, his uh, difficulty responding to racist strangers. Valerie Carr frequently uh, portrays herself as a victim and survivor of patriarchal violence, and her learning to forgive the men in her everyday life uh, informs how she responds to racism. She observes, uh, quote, sick women in America must fight on at least three different fronts, hate and racism out in the world, ignorance and invisibility, even within progressive spaces, and sexism within our own communities. It is still hard for me to speak publicly about sexism in my community when we live in a nation that continues to see turbaned men as violent patriarchs, end quote. The absence of personal moral failing is notable responding to what the author sense as a demand for a perfect victim. If they risk any substantial ethical folly, they might risk being regarded as terrorist, a less deserving recipient of sympathy, or at least a less fit, less zen self-help guru. In light of each respective work's participation in the didactic race memoir genre, a genre with roots in 19th century Christian American sentimentalism, the absence of personal moral failing may be suggestive of the author's attempts at framing self-cultivation in soteriological terms. Put differently, the author's investment in self-cultivation operates both on uh, an orthodox sick investment in self-cultivation while also mobilizing self-cultivation as salvation from evil, which in this case is racism. In her study of Christian sentimentalism in the work of early Asian, uh, early Asian American author Sui Sin Far, Min Song uh, explains that sentimentalism, as specifically 19th century American literary phenomenon, is uh, premised on an emotional and philosophical ethos that celebrates human connection, both personal and communal, and acknowledges the shared devastation of affectional loss. Um, she, each memoir adheres to this premise insofar as Singh and Carr center the importance of family and becoming parents alongside their detailed accounts of Balbir Singh Sodhi's death in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 and the Sikh uh, Temple Massacre in Oak Creek. Song goes on to explain that 19th century sentimental fiction uh, emerges from and remains connected to a Christian way of seeing that, quote, dis uh, dis discovered in the image of a suffering and dying Christ, the source of a moral order hinged on acute affectional loss and still exception, uh, acceptance of such loss as a sign of moral durability, end quote. Unlike the sentimental fiction to which Song refers, Carr and Singh's respected texts do not hinge entirely on stoically accepting loss so much as they narrate how they process loss in non-threatening spiritual terms. Citing a combination of Sikh scripture, Christian rhetoric, and secular le leftist thought, Carr and Singh teach their readers how to process and address uh, racism. Um, uh, hold on a second. Um, what undergirds each author's approach to forgiveness and love is the sick notion of ekonkar or oneness, what is often translated as God. Each author cites Guru Arjun Devji, but to different effect. For the sake of time, I'll focus only on Kar. She cites the rug or him, uh, Nako Bairi uh, Nayib Bigana, or I see no stranger, I see no enemy. She includes a translation of the titular stanza of the, stanza of the rug alongside other um, six shubs, uh, or, which is another word for hymns, as part of the her endnotes. Whenever the phrase is, whenever the phrase, you know, stranger is cited in the body of her text, however, it's legible as a commonplace Christian secular call to empathy. The translated, see no stranger passage she includes at the end reads, however, quote, I have forgotten my, en my envy of others since I have found my sacred company. I see no enemy. I see no stranger. All of us belong to each other. What the divine does, I accept as good. I have received this wisdom from the holy. The one pervades all. 
gazing upon the one, beholding the one, Nanak blossoms forth in happiness, end quote. Carr does not explain how liberal orthodox six might read this passage. The third line imagines a unity that could easily lend itself to a Christian secular rhetoric. The figure of sacred company, the divine, uh, the holy, and the one would appear analogous to a Christian monotheistic god. A non-Sikh audience would know from Carr's text that Guru Nanak is the first guru. So the last line of the stanza might point to the, uh, to the author of the work, um, which Guru Arjan Dev is said to have recorded. A liberal Orthodox Sikh audience would know that I and Nanak are the same figure uh, and that the switch from the pronoun to the figure signals the seeding of the self to the one. While Nanak blossoms forth from the one, Nanak is at the same time separate from the one because he is looking at it and coextensive with the one because he emerges from it. The pronoun I uh, merges the reader with Nanak as Nanak merges with the one and everything else while paradoxically also inhabiting a position of separation. The rug gives a form of... Uh, uh, the form, the rug gives form to a process of becoming one in which the divine is both transcendental and immanent. Carr does not elaborate on this explicitly, though one might read her 10 lessons in revolutionary love as a process of attempting to translate um, this uh, rug in Christian secular terms, uh, while maintaining the centrality of the Christian secular subject, a version of subjectivity that imagines the subject as a discrete unit of person. Carr and Singh participate in their religio religio racialization insofar as they position Sikh thought as compatible with Christian secular thought. They render them themselves as victims of racism whose quasi-Christian yet still foreign spiritual values make them worthy of redemption, rescue, and recognition. And that's all I got. Thank you so much for that presentation and sharing your work with us. And then we will move into the next presentation. Um, and as I mentioned, if we can save our questions for the end, then we can ask all together. Sounds good. Thanks to you both. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you all see that? Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, um, hi everyone. My name is Amina. I am presenting Justice Without Accessibility, Exploring a Disability Justice, Food Justice Way Forward. So just for some quick positionality of myself, um, like I said, my name is Amina. I use the pronouns. Um, I am a master's student in critical disability studies at York University. Um, I'm also disabled and neurodivergent and have personal experiences of housing and food insecurity. Um, so when I had the opportunity to take an elective in my master's program, I elected to take a food justice course. Um, and I found myself really deeply troubled by the disability narratives I found in the food justice literature. And that brings us to, to, to here, to this presentation. Um, so for a quick overview of the agenda, I'm gonna explain a little bit about what disability justice is, a little bit about what food justice is, talk about the non-responsiveness between the two categories, um, and then offer a crypt food justice way forward. So first, uh, what is disability justice? So critical disability studies, disability justice, and crypt theory are bodies of scholarship and activism. Um, and they also sometimes refer to things like MAD studies, MAD pride, and the consumer survivor ex-patient movement. Uh, according to Room, CDS is a field of study that recognizes the expertise of disabled people in understanding their own life while advocating for progressive societal change. It encompasses a diverse interdisciplinary set of um, theoretical approaches, and it sees disability as both a lived reality that people experience, as well as a social and political definition or a social and political identity. Um, and, and this means that it has implications for hierarchies of power and oppression. It also means that it aims to change these material realities for disabled people, while also changing the way that we think about disabled body minds. Crip theory. Um, essentially combines disability theory with queer theory, um, thinking about how norms around ability intersect with norms around gender and sexuality. Um, CRIP has historically been used as a slur towards disabled folks, particularly those with mobility impairments, um, but it's also a term that's been broadly reclaimed by many disabled folks, kind of similar in history to the, the use of the word queer. 
and disability justice. So Sins Invalid is a disability justice performance project and, and activist collective, and they coined this term. They explain it as a developing framework that some call a movement, largely done by individuals within their respective settings under the leadership of disabled people of color and of queer and gender nonconforming disabled people. Folks tend to understand disability justice as a second kind of more radical wave of organizing following the disability rights movements. Um, and it really focuses on moving past the goal of just attaining civil rights under state law um, and instead challenging some of these hierarchies of power and oppression. That was like a super quick disability studies 101. Um, and now I'm going to do something similar with food justice. So the food justice movement concerns itself not only with enabling food access, but also defining these issues as structural, similar to how I was discussing earlier. Um, and it really sees food as a way into broader change making along um, gender, class, race, citizenship, so on. Um, it's connected to the concept of food sovereignty, which was introduced by La Via Campesina, um, which essentially has to do with humans having control over how we feed ourselves, how we relate and use land and, and land-based resources, um, and how we interact with other cultures and groups of people. Um, food justice scholars have done significant work to incorporate intersecting and layered analyses, um, including things like migrant justice, fat activism, indigenous sovereignty, climate justice, women and gender minority rights, as well as prison abolition. All of these analyses implicate one another, um, and a truly just and responsive food justice movement is one that incorporates an analysis that not only speaks to each of these categories and individuals separately, but also an especially response to, for example, um, a fat indigenous woman who was incarcerated. Interestingly, the work of incorporating a disability analysis um, is not super common, um, but I argue that disability justice can similarly offer its analysis to build towards a more well-rounded and responsive food justice imagining. And that is what I will begin to talk about. So one of the, the places where I see a real uh, lack of analysis from a disability perspective in food justice spaces is this idea of normal body minds. Um, so the way that food justice scholars position non-normative body minds and particularly fat and sick folks um, is one that is indicative of deficit. Um, food studies tends to hold this kind of underlying assumption that disability is inherently negative experience and one that should be avoided or fixed. Um, and I think we can we can feel why that might be troubling. Um, this is especially troubling when that rhetoric is used to justify an individualization, so like individual critique and even violence on fat and disabled people. Um, and this especially shows up when folks are also marginalized along lines of, lines of gender, race, class, etc. Um, Dr. Rabbi Julia watts Belser um, does some really important work around climate change and climate justice. Um, and she states that if we persist in framing disability and climate change as a problem of physical vulnerability, we miss the underlying realities of structural violence, how ableism, racism, class inequality, and other forms of oppression work together to compound and intensify risk. And I think that's just like a really wonderful way of, of putting that concept um, and makes it really clear. Um, part of tied into all of, all of this complicated uh, ways of thinking about bodies. Um, I think it's really interesting that food justice actively cultivates an anti-colonial politic um, while also utilizing these eugenic ideologies, um, which Arabella Simoniar explain, um, eugenic ideologies associate race, gender, and disability with disease, degeneracy, biological inferiority, and dependence. Um, so really quite troubling. Um, a quick content warning that the next slide has some quotes that exhibit this, um, and I know that that can be difficult for folks. So one of the most explicit places I see this deficit model is in the language used to describe disability within food studies scholarship. Um, Pollen, um, in a, a pretty popular food studies book called The Omnivore's Dilemma, um, has this really troubling quote that I'm going to read out, um, and it says, 
the R slur and the insane, the two day old infant and the advanced Alzheimer patient cannot participate in ethical decision making any more than a monkey can. Just breathing through that one. Um, this is really outdated language and I'm a pretty horrifying comparison um, and not uncommon in food justice rhetoric, unfortunately. Um, we also see disability justice scholars using words such as burden, slow moving disaster and insidious, as in these examples from Galvez. Um, and Susan Sontag actually really does a good job of describing this phenomenon um, where disease and disability is seen in kind of imperial terms as if it's invading society, um, treated as this like evil predator and not um, a condition of the human experience. Um, and Susan argues, and I would argue that instead of locating the invading intentionally violent force as within disability, it's really vital to locate the invading intentionally violent force as within colonialism and imperialism. Um, because these forces, colonization uses food to enact harm on marginalized communities. Um, and it feels really, it's just not responsive when scholars and activists supposedly working towards food justice are marginalizing disabled and fat. A lot of food justice scholarship also relies on these really falsely dichotomized categories of natural versus unnatural, good versus bad, real versus fake, healthy versus unhealthy. And those of you who are in the keynote heard quite a bit about this already. Um, and Simpson argues that through a disability justice politic, food justice is a site where ideals privileging normal, healthy body minds can be challenged, and I would say must be challenged. Um, we can see the really not so subtle themes of like pure bloodlines, static bodies and unchanging landscapes and like this rhetoric of naturalness and unnaturalness, which makes it really clear that there is a pretty deep ableist logic within food justice literature. Um, and this is also tied to the way that, that food justice scholarship tends to view food as a necessary cure for problematic body minds, um, or in other words, good food is a good thing for bad bodies. Um, which again ties back to that like eugenic idea, that idea that some bodies and therefore people are good and deserving and worthy and some are, you know, all of the, the other opposites. The last thing I wanted to say in this section was this idea that food is not neutral. Um, instead, it lies at the complex interactions of cultural economics and politics, as Hall says. Um, and the idea that natural is socially constructed. So not only is, you know, the nature spaces we access constructed, such as like creating a walking trail that is not wheelchair accessible, um, but also just the idea, the concept of what we think of as natural is constructed through norms of gender, of sexuality, of class, race, nation, so on and so forth. Um, the rhetoric of there being good and bad foods um, falls into this nutritionism and healthism trap, I guess you could say. Um, and these things essentially refer to a form of medicalization, ableism, and sanism um, that really comes from a Western European perspective, which of course further impacts communities of color and indigenous nations. Um, and really ironically, this idea that you should control your food and you should modify your body by controlling food intake is understood as more natural than eating the food you desire and you have available to you and has been culturally handed down to you. Um, so we can, we, this is a really great example of social construction and what natural means. So what could cripping food justice look like? What are some ways forward? There is some existing disability justice food justice scholarship. It's pretty limited. Um, there are like maybe four or five authors that I can like stay engaged with this deeply in their work. Um, so Kim Q Hall offers a vision of a queer crip feminist food politics drawing on disability justice principles and does a really good job of integrating those things. Natasha Simpson argues for a repoliticization of disability that allows for collectivization and organizing. Many other scholars have investigated disproportionate rates of food insecurity among disabled and mad communities, but most tend to miss this kind of central analysis of ableism and sanism and depoliticize 
um, accessibility, which is not not what we need. Um, outside of an academic literature, I always like to point there as well. Um, disabled activists and community members are deeply engaged in thinking about how to feed themselves and their communities. Um, and disability justice activists have contributed to food justice work, particularly in relation to creating more accessible collective growing spaces and community gardens. Um, and pushing for disability justice beyond just legal compliance. So creating fundamental systems level change instead of just, you know, ticking the box that your door has a automatic button or whatever. Fat studies might be the field that most closely works to tie food studies with critical disability studies. Many fat studies scholars are doing the work of critiquing food justice for how it others fat people existing in stigmatized and marginalized bodies. Larson stresses that links between disability and fatness are undeniable, and that fat stigma is a product of ableist cultural and patriarchal norms. Um, and fat studies does a really great job of utilizing key disability justice paradigms of understanding things such as like everybody mind having inherent worth, um, critiquing the medical industrial complex and taking doctors off of this like all knowing pedestal. Um, identifying ways to design both physical and conceptual spaces with all bodies in mind, things like that. Of course, comprehensive suggestions for, for fixing this are well beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, however, I wanted to offer a couple of thoughts. Theoretically, this might include um, analyses that recognize and refuse the intertwined exploitation of bodies and environments without demonizing the illnesses and disabilities that result from such exploitation, as CAFER offers us, um, as well as a food justice that is critical of public health narratives of fatness as deficit, which pulls from Robinson's work. Um, Ferrant also suggests some concrete ways forward, including equitable food access, accessible food assistance sites, such as food banks and universally designed farms, um, and cooking classes that are intentionally created for disabled and neurodivergent people. Um, there's also this idea that the language used in both food studies scholarship and critical disability studies scholarship should make an effort to kind of bridge the gap and use language that other folks who aren't embedded in the fields will understand. So to conclude, I just kind of wanted to, to offer these thoughts in my effort to posit a way of you know, thinking, theorizing, acting, and knowing um, that doesn't leave anyone behind. Um, I think of this work as fundamentally for um, lots of folks, but especially like rural farmers, um, folks experiencing food insecurity, migrant agricultural workers, physically disabled folks, mad people, fat people, indigenous people, um, incarcerated people. I could go on, and I will not, um, but you get it. Um, and I also just, have a lot of gratitude and care for all the folks who exist in these intersections, who are doing the work in their communities to feed folks, doing the work in the academy to, to bring these perspectives forward. Um, this presentation cannot exist without the folks doing the work already. Um, and I invite you, if you have any questions or comments, to connect with me. My email is on screen. I can also put it in the chat. Um, and that would be really helpful as I continue to navigate proposing a more concrete way forward um, in integrating these perspectives. Um, so thank you all. I really appreciate your time and I will pass it off to the next speaker. Uh, thanks so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Rochelle Wilson. I'm joining from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm just going to be sharing my screen here. All right. Can I get a signal that folks can see um, my slideshow? Let's see. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Appreciate the thumbs up. Okay. So, I am going to be talking about a podcast that I'm actually currently working on, and so I'm deep in the trenches, um, and hopefully just share some insight um, from this project with you all. I'm trying to advance my slides. So some of my big talking points are going to be just an overview of how the podcast came to be. And kind of a behind the scenes look at some of the practicalities of an audio project like this. 
I feel like oftentimes at conferences, we're kind of on that conceptual level and theoretical level. And here, I just thought it might be interesting uh, and informative to hear kind of maybe what it looks like um, in the brass tacks to actually do these things. I also just believe that the nuts and bolts of a project, you can still body out your politics and your values um, in those spaces. So I want to talk about that and reflect on what it means to do public humanities work. I'm not sure how many of us are here, here are social scientists versus humanists versus, you know, whatever other disciplinary categories they may be, but I sense that this conference is kind of trying to maybe dismantle those and find ways forward um, that are interdisciplinary. So, but I am going to be speaking from a public humanities perspective as someone trained uh, in the humanities and primarily in literature and in um, media. And also just talk about the layered meanings of public trust, which is the name of the podcast. So a little bit about me, I'm a PhD candidate in Scandinavian studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and so that's, you know, a bit about my background, but I'm kind of an omnivore and I seek to be a generalist in a lot of ways. So that's kind of how I have found myself doing a lot of different odds and ends during grad school. I'm a working class first gen student, so I've always had to maintain part time work, and that's how I've picked up some of these skills, and I'm happy to talk about that with anyone who wants to follow up. Um, I've been an editor for over a decade, doing freelance editing for academic publications, um, as well as EdgeFX, which is a magazine produced by graduate students at UW-Madison about environmental humanities. Encourage you to check that out, edgeFX.net. Uh, also pitch us um, if you want to maybe do a, a short essay form of anything you've presented here. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. I'm also a former radio producer, so for a little over four years, I was working at WRT 89.9 FM here in Madison and producing a daily talk show. So that's the photo of me um, to the left here, and I'm kind of sitting at a soundboard, <laughs> um, and I, I learned to do that, among other things, while I was there. And it was a, a great experience, and it really opened the door for me to get into audio storytelling. So since then, I've worked a, in a couple different capacities as a podcast producer, um, most specifically for a new podcast called College Land, or it was new at the time we were launching it. Um, and that's about kind of labor in higher education and, and unlocking some of those untold stories from different campuses. And this year I'm a public humanities fellow. And basically that means it takes graduate students and places us with community organizations to do work with them. And my partner organization is Midwest Environmental Advocates. They're um, actually, I'll explain a little bit more about them here. So MEA is a nonprofit law center that's based here in Madison, but that you know does advocacy and litigation throughout the state of Wisconsin. They work with communities who are facing environmental injustice of different kinds. Some of their big issues include clean water, clean air, open government, uh, PFAS, which we'll be talking a lot about shortly. Um, and for those who may not know, these are also called forever chemicals, and you may have been reading about them in the news um, because they're used in a lot of daily household products, uh, especially like waterproof things like rain boots and raincoats, waterproof mascara, there are menstrual products, there's food packaging. So PFAS is kind of everywhere and we're just now realizing, or at least the public is kind of getting to realize um, how, how dangerous these are. Um, and so this is something that uh, we're working on at MEA. Uh, there's also been work on pipelines and on mining, like frac sand mining here in Wisconsin. So the organization is small. Um, it's kind of primarily composed of a legal team who, you know, essentially goes to court and, and helps litigate cases on behalf of clients. And oftentimes they're clients who maybe don't have as much access to pay. Um, so they're, you know, trying to work with grassroots communities and individuals who are facing these injustices. And then there's also a small comms team or communications team. And that's kind of where I'm embedded. And they're the ones who are sort of sharing out the stories um, of MEA and their clients, including some of the successes. And there's just lots of grassroots work that's happening. Um, MEA, you know, they're not just like the heroes who come swooping in. They're really kind of building off of community organizing that's already happening. So when we were talking about doing a project for this public humanities fellowship, uh, MEA told me right away that they wanted to tell client or community stories and really highlight those in some way and use my skills and my time there with them to do that. 
So we talked about some possible projects. We talked about maybe I could write some op-eds or make some fact sheets for journalists. Um, I could do some interviews or profiles that would go up on the website. But ultimately, they saw my background in podcasting and that was really exciting to them. So that's ultimately what where we landed is like, let's do a podcast. Um, and some of the things that are great about a podcast for a situation like this, I mean, it was a new undertaking for MEA. Um, and so it was one way that I could really support their work um, from, you know, my position as an audio storyteller. It's a great opportunity to highlight community and expert voices on these issues. But making a podcast is not easy. <laughs> Maybe you've heard otherwise, but it's, it, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. And so I was kind of trying to approach this, you know, some challenges included the budget, um, the workflow and the distribution of labor, because I couldn't be the only one doing this, uh, but their team is small. And, you know, this project was largely supposed to be spearheaded by me and also just an ambitious timeline, because by the time I had learned about the organization um, and you know, proposed to this project, you know, I was down to maybe like six months worth of uh, time to do this work on a part-time basis and make a, a podcast. Um, so when I was approaching them, you know, I essentially set up these questions, which I would encourage you to consider pr with pretty much any project. Um, this is kind of specific to audio projects, but you need to think about what your purpose is. What kind of information and stories are we wanting to share? What audiences are we hoping to reach? And it's really easy to just kind of be like everyone or the public or as many people as possible. But the more specific you can be, um, I think the better success that you're going to have about who it is that you want to hear these stories you want to think about the format. So there's a lot of different podcast formats out there. There's kind of, you know, interview styles, there's more narrative storytelling styles. So we had to talk through that. Um, what's the target like for episodes and what would the release schedule look like? There's also a ton of kind of branding that goes into releasing a new podcast, or there can be anyway, where we're needing to give it a title. And I especially love to get, um, you know, to employ artists to work on the cover art and the music, um, if at all possible, because I want to support independent artists. Um, and then there's also all of these other considerations about where are we going to record this? Where are we getting the equipment, the field mics? You know, what, what's the software that we're using um, to edit things? What's the workflow? How are we going to schedule this out and assign different tasks? You know, what really is our budget? Um, and what can we account for there, even maybe on a small budget? And just thinking about when it's time to launch, how can we publicize um, the podcast and make sure that folks know about it and can hear it. So as I was going into this, thinking about doing a podcast for an environmental law firm, I turned to Broken Ground, which is a wonderful podcast produced out of the Southern Environmental Law Center. So it was a real analog to what I would be doing with MEA. Um, and so I just tried to take a lot of tips from them. Now, the great thing about their podcast is, I mean, it's just like wonderful and it's a good thing to take notes from. However, they have a pretty, they have a larger team than just one person. You know, I think there's at least five people who, who work on the podcast series. And so I was going to have to think about how can I, you know, try to use this as a, as an example, but also maybe be realistic about our situation. Um, I also was encouraged by the fact that their first season had only four episodes. Um, so that encouraged me that perhaps our season could be similarly short, you know, quote unquote. And I just went about doing these informational interviews because I just wanted to know everything about what it looks like to start a podcast um, especially like a narrative nonfiction podcast, which would be new to me. So I talked with radio journalists and podcasters at Wisconsin Public Radio and Wisconsin Watch. I talked to public humanities professionals like at Wisconsin Humanities. I spoke with oral historians. I talked with other graduate students and previous fellows. And that actually led me to, um, to meet some university comms people, um, including Bonnie Willison at the Wisconsin Sea Grant, who eventually became my partner in this project. So one of the great things about inter informational interviews is you actually can find potential collaborators. And that was great in addition to just getting all the information about what does it look like to do a project like this. Um, and so I pitched a few different ideas to MEA and I won't go through this in detail, but just to kind of show you the kinds of things that I was conceptually thinking about, I thought, could we do you know, a water series? Could we do sort of a Native Nations um, series? Could we do something about open government um, and transparency and accountability? So I pitched all of these different ideas, um, but from this actually 
emerged an idea that MEA had for me, which was to cover PFAS. Um, so the podcast, you know, kind of came together. Um, we decided on the name Public Trust, and I'll get into that in a little bit, and a narrative nonfiction format, which basically is kind of similar to maybe a lot of podcasts that you've heard before. I'm like suddenly blanking now that I need to come up with an example, but essentially it's whenever you hear a narrator with kind of stitched together different stories and sources, archival audio, etc., um, and it was going to be about stories about PFAS in Wisconsin that included both community members who have been dealing with this and experts um, doing a four episode season like Broken Ground, partnering with this Wisconsin Sea Grant uh, for research and support because they saw an opportunity there as well. They work on water issues. Um, and kind of enlisting other partners. Um, we had a volunteer at MEA who was willing to do the graphic design. Um, my previous employment at WORT kind of gave me access to the radio studios there for um, expert interviews. Um, and my brother actually is a composer, so I was able to enlist him for the music. Um, so our episodes um, essentially kind of ended up like this, like this was sort of the new pitch deck. Um, and it's still pretty similar to how we are going about the podcast. Um, in episode four, what I really wanted to bring environmental justice into this podcast and to talk about a community of color who's facing PFAS. Uh, one of the constraints, though, was that, you know, I'm working with a, a law organization and they really wanted to focus on clients that they've actually worked with. And so that kind of limited some of the stories that we could tell. And so I tried to leave that last episode open to maybe bring in some other voices. And I'm still kind of negotiating what that might look like. <clears throat> so just really quickly, the podcast workflow, what it can kind of look like once you're done with that conceptualization and it's starting to get to the brass tacks, you're going to want to conduct your interviews um, and that can be in studio or in the field. I really prioritize doing those two things because kind of in the era of COVID, um, there's so much Zoom audio that there's, a, I think, a lot of Zoom audio fatigue, and I really wanted to see what I could do to capture the intimacy of human voice in person as much as possible. Um, you're then going to log your tape, which is kind of an old term um, that has persisted, which basically just means you're listening back to what you've recorded. You're, you know, capturing highlights and notes and making sure that you know what's at your disposal to use in the podcast. And you're, that has a kind of co-constitutive relationship with writing the script so that you kind of see what you have and how you can stitch things together. And you're going to be writing out that narration. You're going to record the narration. In that case, that's me. Um, and hopefully get an audio draft where things are maybe kind of stitched together loosely. There's a lot of ways to do this. And we can talk about it in the Q&A if you're curious. But this is maybe a point to get feedback from your partners um, and then do final edits. Uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but essentially there were two communities that we went and did field interviews in. One was Peshtigo, which is in northern Wisconsin, kind of close to the border with Michigan. Um, and that's me. Uh, we went in March, like after that huge snowstorm. So there was a lot of snow on the ground. Um, but we spoke with Trigvi Rood, who is a resident there, Ruth Kowalski. And um, that's Ruth's uh, you know, water system that she's been using in, while she has unsafe tap water, um, and Kayla Furton, who is a, a parent and an activist on this issue. Um, we more recently, a couple weeks ago, went to French Island, um, and that's where we met Lee Donahue, who's on the town board there and a big activist on this issue. She really laid out, gave us the lay of the land. Um, we spoke to Jim and Marge, in their home, and this is their quote, famous sink. I guess so, some journalists took a picture of the sink and it's just been kind of circulating through the news ever since. Um, and uh, this is Peter, uh, he's a father of two small twins. And, um, oh Matt, I'm blanking on our final guest names, but we essentially visited with this couple at the end of our trip. Um, so I wanted to, I, I'm running low on time, but I do want to kind of show you what it looks like to log tape a little bit. We're working with software called Descript, um, which essentially basically takes any audio file and gives you a transcript and then kind of lets you work in it as though it's a Word document. Um, so you can see how, you know, we've crossed things out here. And then hopefully when I go to play this, you'll hear it. Um, it's taken out of the audio as well. You see a lot of bald eagles. They fish up and down the bay and they'll use some of the big old white pines here in the neighborhood uh, for perches and 
wait for an opportunity to find something to eat. So we had that in, those interviews with Trigvi, with Ruth, and with Kayla, and we were kind of, you can see how I say funny or interesting clip from um, Trigvi, or a clip from Trigvi about receiving a letter in 2017, and we can literally copy and paste things and kind of put this together. So I just kind of wanted to show you there's a lot of um, ways that actually the, this kind of AI I, I approve of, it's really helped us. Um, I also have been doing uh, interviews with experts in the studio, including scientists, journalists, public policy experts, and lawyers. Um, Amber, is it okay if I take an extra minute to kind of wrap here? Yeah, absolutely. And then we'll still have um, about 20 minutes for a question and answer. Great. Um, so I wanted to just think a little bit about the layered meanings of public trust. Uh, first of all is the public trust doctrine, which exists here in Wisconsin, which is basically about you know, protecting and making natural resources available to all Wisconsinites. Um, I also was thinking about public humanities and what can public or publics mean and public trust of institutions. And here's where one of our experts come in, uh, Manny Teodoro from UW-Madison, who recently co-authored a book, The Prophets of Distrust, um, which is essentially tracking the correspondence or the correlation between um, tap water and trust in government. So whether you drink tap water or bottled water and what that says about um, you politically and your trust in government. Um, a kind of shortened version of this quote is just that nothing that government does is more important than water regulation and provision when it comes to trust in local governments. So I wanted to just end with a few um, kind of observations and takeaways. When you're doing public humanities work, you'll often have multiple sets of priorities and frameworks to balance because you're coming in as a researcher or an academic with all of those norms but you also have different community partners. I was working with MEA, who is a law firm who wanted to promote you know, the work that they're doing. And so I can't exactly maybe think like a journalist, but I'm also working with you know, the community partners in the communities that we actually visited and they may have their own agendas and ideas about what they want this project to look like or why they're participating. Um, so this requires you to use mixed methodologies. I found that I was using kind of some of the best practices from comms, from journalism, from oral history. And you also need to think about how your project can be communicated out. It was wonderful to have Bonnie Willison from the Wisconsin Sea Grant go with me on those field trips so that she was taking those photos that I have now, right? And, and we can share those out. And there's other ways for this to kind of continue to live on and for people to steward these stories after the project is done. And just remember to be flexible and accommodating as much as possible when you're working with community partners. You know, I think you'll find that journalists like talking on the phone and people who work in offices and or who are working with you through an office job in that capacity will probably prefer an email. Um, but a lot of community members will prefer text messaging. So just, you know, be as flexible as possible in the way that you communicate and execute your project. Um, it's just so important to build those reciprocal relationships with community partners so that knowledge sharing is flowing in both directions, to seek out collaborators and not try to do anything on your own to try to implement principles of equity budgeting. Um, and I have a link that I can share out to Marian Voices, oral historians who have um, a great manifesto on this. Um, give yourself as much time and grace as you possibly can because things do tend to go awry uh, in big projects like this, but you know, you can always recover. And stay humble, but remember that you have a lot of knowledge and experience to contribute. I think as a graduate student, we're so used to um, I guess kind of being a little bit meek in the way that we approach some of these things, like we're not totally an expert yet, we don't have our PhD yet or whatever it may be. But it turns out that, you know, a lot of these community partners and community members see you as extremely knowledgeable and having a lot of valuable experience to bring to the table. So just remember that as you're approaching this, especially if this kind of work is new to you. And thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for letting me take a couple extra minutes to finish there. Thank you to each of our presenters. Um, and as I mentioned, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A now. Um, I have a couple of ideas that I can throw in here um, if the conversation's slow, um, but I really welcome um, presenters to ask questions of one another um, and also those in the audience to speak up either in the chat or using your voice. Um, there's few enough in here. I, uh, you can just unmute and go ahead. And if we need a more formal turn taking, then we can move to that.
I had a question for Imuna. Um, and actually, I think it applies to the other presentation as well. So maybe just anyone jumps in here. But I think part of what I saw as a through thread in all of this is the kind of situatedness of the scholar or the researcher where um, you come into contact with these ideas academically, but you also have these um, important identity and intersections of identity that you find yourself um, being connected with to the project as well. Um, and I, I know that there are a lot of feminist and other scholars who are kind of trying to normalize um, bringing yourself to the work um, in a more holistic and meaningful way. But I, I guess I'm just thinking about this um, maybe in new ways, um, because I have basically recently begun to identify with the disability community. And um, so that's like totally new to me. And I, um, I'm i used to thinking about it academically and less so personally. And so like, I've just been hungry to hear all of these really, you know, kind of smart and compassionate perspectives. Um, so any anything that you may have to say or anything that that inspired? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, congratulations on a incoming disability identity. It's a an interesting journey for for anyone I know. Um, yeah, I think there's there's still a little bit of like tentativeness or like fear um, in in saying pretty vulnerable things in academic contexts. I think I've been in a lot of academic contexts where you're supposed to kind of be like objective and and stand back and not emotionally invested, um, which is not the work that I do and not the work that I'm drawn to doing. Um, I don't know that the particular questions that I'm asking would be asked by a non-disabled person. Um, and I think it is, I mean, this is, I'm not saying anything new, but it's impossible to separate my experience from it. So it feels important that I name that. Um, but I definitely have like a moment of like having to take a breath when I like put something like that on a slide or like share that um, because I, I get, I have fears, very rooted fears that folks will discount my perspectives and my scholarship because I disclose that I'm like emotionally invested and personally invested in these things. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of disability work talking about like the politics of positioning yourself and like, should you have to? And and if you have to, like, how does that maybe, how is that taken up by like white folks or not white folks? And, and like the real financial and career consequences that you can have by disclosing. Um, and all of that to say, I think it's a complicated topic. I think it's one that academia needs to make more room to talk about um, because the more that folks, yeah, I don't know, when folks continue to get penalized for disclosing, people continue to do kind of this like stand back, fake objective research where they're like not engaging ethically with communities. Um, and I'm like a little bit preaching to the choir, I think. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, I like sometimes when I think about it, I don't feel like I ever could have chosen not to be a post-colonialist because I show up this way and people sort of expect that of me. So like um, there's like a weird um, and that isn't to say that I don't arrive at it with my own investments either, but it's just a strange sort of like um, I think maybe my work this is like what I presented today is like me working through some objects that I'm planning uh, to like write about in a longer way. Um, and, and what's really important to me too is being able to speak to six through um, like their theology. I mean, I am, I was raised in the faith tradition um, and part of decolonizing um, secular theory is about allowing like sick modes or like non-Western modes of thought actually having like real space. And that includes like maybe non-standard forms of metaphysics. So like, there's something of like um there's something of that even though I'm not particularly like woo woo about things there's something about like learning how to speak to people on their own terms that informs why I study like uh scripture but while I'm also trying to put that in conversation with like theory proper um and uh I don't know I guess like yeah I, it's interesting because I also don't have um because uh I am or some of the other intersections of my identity, I guess, um, as, you know, both a mentally ill and a queer, like, sick, um, I don't really have uh, a lot of social standing within my community. So there's something about using the sort of academic kind of context to, like, 
find some sort of form of authority to speak back to my people. So it's like a weird, it's like hard to love a community that doesn't like know how to love you in return. And then it's also like this, um, I don't know. I think that there's something about like, there's something also, I, I can't say that I'm, I mean, I've experienced theory as a self-help sort of thing too. So I'm not like immune to that kind of, um, that kind of uh, relationship with it either. Um, yeah, I see in the chat that there's, you know, Immuna has thoughts on this too. Um, queer and trans religious person. Yeah. And I also, I was raised religious and now I, I don't know what I am, but it's not quite that, <laughs> you know? So. Yeah. I was really relating to a lot of the threads you were saying. I try and bring in um, like Jewish ways of understanding land and food um, into my work um, and also have complicated relationships as like queer, trans, mentally disabled, there, there's complications here. And I was really relating to what you were saying in your presentation about like having a hard time talking about that because not wanting to like perpetuate ideas of like how people think of or see your culture in a negative light, but also wanting to address the like real problems that exist in, in all communities and spaces. So I, I feel that a lot. Uh, I have a, a question about, um, I mean, about working with real activists. Um, I'm sort of interested to know, like, I'm sure there's just such a complicated relationship between like what you learn on the ground versus like what you learn sort of in books and all of that. But at the same time, like, you know, sometimes activists get it wrong too. We have like a way of like really acting as if like people on the ground have this like special, I mean, everybody has something to offer, but it's not like every person who with has a perfect perspective of things. Um, and so like the, the two memoirs that I'm working with here are both written by like people that I, I mean, I really dislike if I'm honest and like, I don't really like, uh, I'm trying to find a way to like generously read them, but I'm also just deeply, like I don't want to like leverage my academic privilege in a way that like makes it sound as if their ideas are nothing or stupid but because it still helps real people but at the same time their rhetoric also licenses or like obscures other forms of violence so it's this weird sort of like um it's a sort of catch-22 where I want to say yeah you have limitations but also like I hear you or like you're not saying nothing I I'm just curious to to know how you think about like when um, your interlocutors, however that looks, sort of like have, um, how do you deal, how do you engage generously with imperfect interlocutors? Maybe that's what I'm trying to say. I don't, I don't, like the thing that immediately comes to mind, uh, I'm not really super satisfied with this answer, but I think part of my job uh, in the way that I see like what I do and some of that has shifted. I think if I had just been like purely doing academic and campus based research this whole time, I might feel differently. Um, but because I've been a radio producer at a community radio station, whose like entire ethos is like sharing the voice of the community. I kind of see, you know, part of like my privilege and my positionality is like kind of having a platform and knowing how to share these stories and, and being able to hit publish and, you know, being either at a radio station or, or having a podcast feed or whatever it is. Um, so I think I, I like maybe have a, a bit of a journalist thought about it where I think of these as like sources and they're sharing something about their experience that might be worthwhile to hear. And it really isn't about like agreeing or disagreeing so much as it is about, um, you know, like giving them a, a bit of a forum for a minute um, to share their story. And it's, it, but it is really tricky because you can easily like get to the point where you have, like, if your ethos is just to share everything, you know, you still want to have like guidelines and standards for what makes it in, in the end. So it's, it's a tricky balance. Um, I have a little bit of an answer to this too, because it's something that I have been, um, engaging with really strongly in the work that I, I do um, in like in education, but not necessarily within, like not within my own research. Um, so in K-12 education and, and um, higher education, but not like 
as like a job, not as a researcher to just sort of like give some context. And then I'll, I'm trying to be mindful of my commitments to confidentiality as well. Um, but I've been, I've really been working um, with this idea of like paradox and that like I can hold my truth and you can hold your truth. And I've been um, working with like several groups of teachers, training them on this to work with each other and to work with the, the parents and caregivers of children in their classes. Um, and we've really been arriving at this idea together that like one of our individual truths is not the truth. It's like this collective truth that we can build with one another. Um, and so I think by like putting yourself into conversation with them. And I like, I actually wrote down this phrase, engage generously. Like if you are engaging generously with them, um, then you're already like kind of getting it right in that way. Like this is what I think and feel when I hear them say these things to challenge um, where you do see um, like violence or intersection. And I think like for myself as a, as a non-black Latina, I think a lot about like the anti-blackness in my community. Right. And so like, I want to engage generously with my community and also call out the anti-blackness that exists with us or like the anti-queerness and the, you know, the challenges with gender and all these things. Um, but then there, Parker Palmer writes about the paradox and he talks about like, being able to distinguish between hot and cold is also one of the things that keeps us safe. Um, and so I hold these things together, right? Like that, again, like back to the paradox idea that like we can hold it all and also like we can make distinctions and have boundaries and say like, this is harmful um, while having the humility to know too that like we might not be getting it right either. Like maybe the act, like, it's easy, I think, for those of us who are activists and academics to see how folks who are just on the ground might not have this conceptual understanding and how academics don't have this understanding of the real world and like sort of position ourselves as seeing both of those things, but also like someone else could look at our perspective and see the pieces where we are are missing or lacking. I can offer a quick thought. Um, in this particular work, I'm not at this point talking to activists, um, but I am doing a lot of reading and analyzing activist writing. Um, and I also have a hard time kind of not, I don't want to discredit the work and the like change and um, like rad radical things that these folks offer. And also I see very, I feel invisibilized by it as a disabled person. And I see how it has harmed my community. Um, and I think like when I bring forward quotes, particularly, I'm not saying like this person is bad and everything that they've said and done is worthless for the, for the movement. Um, I say, this is a wonderful analysis. How much better could it be if it also took into account X, Y, Z people. Um, and sometimes, I don't know, people get caught in that black and white, like um, this person's bad, this person's good, which is like exactly what I'm critiquing. This food is bad, this food is good. Um, and I try and where I can, which is difficult to do in like 15 minute conference presentations, but where I can, I try and, and emphasize like, it's really great that we've done the work to, you know, start to think about indigenous sovereignties, to start to think about prison abolition and also Yeah, I wanted to share because I, I I thought of something like concrete that may, may be useful, um, which is I essentially in one of the um, sets of interviews that we did, the field interviews with community members who have been dealing with PFAS in their water system since 2017. And I didn't get to really get into like what that means, but it just means the water isn't safe for them to drink. And so they've had to have bottled water shipped in and like Culligan, you know, five gallon things shipped in and and things like that. Um, and one of the people we talked to, like, had this whole binder, um, and, like, that was, like, PFAS, and it was all this, like, research that she had done when she first heard that it was in her water, and for, as far as I could tell, I mean, she kind of started, like, prattling off all of these different things, and I think it was, like, sort of a mix of, like, peer-reviewed science, 
you know, science comms and journalism, but like maybe some conspiracy theories like sprinkled in there or just kind of like blog posts, you know, unverified. And she had some suspicions about how long has the government known about this and how long has the military been using this and how long have they been hiding it from us? And I was like, hmm, you know, what do we do with this audio? Like, we're not, we're not actually airing everything that everyone says, you know, so I could just like cut it out. But I also thought, you know, what she was saying revealed something about her experience and her anxiety dealing with this and the way that everyone who finds that they have PFAS in their community kind of has to become like a mini little expert or researcher to figure out what's going on and self-advocate. And so I think, you know, our decision is going to be as she starts kind of launching into this to kind of like lower the audio levels and to narrate, you know, over top of her, some of the things that we do know and can verify for the purposes of the podcast, because I don't think she cares if people know every bullet point that she made. I think she cares that they know that she really looked into it and she had th this list of this long laundry list of concerns. Um, and so I think that you can bring that, uh, you know, what it is that she was trying to say in that moment. And obviously I'm making a judgment call and that's an editorial decision. And there's a lot of ethics to like interrogate as you're making those decisions, but ultimately I do have to make them. And from what, you know, from my experience meeting with her, I think that that would be like an appropriate way to deal with something like that, where I ran into someone maybe like saying things I couldn't quite use in the final product, but whose experience I nonetheless want to share out. We just have about two, now we're down to one minute. So <laughs> are there any last thoughts before I close? Everybody's good, cool. Um, oh yeah, maybe folks can speak a little bit more about what their next steps are with their projects and where or how they wish for it to go and what other actions can folks take um, to help their research translate to the relevant populations and not get stuck in academia. Um, because we are right at time, I am just going to like mention my closing remarks and then um, perhaps we could just stay on for a few minutes for those who um, do have additional time um, for each of you who wish to to share out about what your next steps are um, and how you might be communicating that to populations outside of academia. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming today and to this session um, and then make a note that we have um, three more student panels tomorrow. Um, I have it on my board up here when we start, which is 1015. Um, so join us again, 1015. Again, everything is in central time. So if you're in a different time zone, um, please make that calculation so that you don't miss something that you're hoping to attend. Um, and then, yeah, I'll let each of you share out and then we can close out the session. Thank you. Yeah, um, so my, so my project, my like larger dissertation project as I've imagined it looks at uh, memoirs written by uh, sick diasporic women. And um, it's mostly kind of about thinking about how uh, honor works in our community or like what's, is it as I talk about in my talk? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think about what sort of like theological practices licensed like honor-based violence. Um, and so, uh, but also as opposed to just saying honor is bad, I kind of want to, because it's like kind of culturally important, I, I want to think about ways of rethinking it. Like Sikhism isn't necessarily a, a religion about prescribing rules. It's more about like working through paradox. Um, so it's about, yeah, it, it's, it, it's um, though like, you know, colonial translations and all of that of Sikhism have become kind of more like God centric and very like conservative and surprisingly Christian ways. Um, yeah, the sort of approach uh, that I'm developing is kind of about trying to see like what would it mean to read Sikh women um, in conversation with like a Sikh saints like literature, like hagiography. Um, and so, like, uh, and it's kind of about like, it's kind of about making saints a little more ordinary and making like sick women a little more saintly insofar as like there has we have to be able to listen to people that are hurt most by our religious rhetoric um so there's like that's that's like the fancy version of what this project is like the um the like 
I'm hoping to, to write a memoir when I'm done called Sick and Tired, um, spelled like this, uh, um, where I like a kind of talk about what writing this kind of project is like um, and talk to real sex kind of about uh, their theology and things like this. So like it's it, right now I'm just still like working through ideas and figuring out how to say it to people that could give me a job. Um, and then like, you know, after that, it's I, I'm planning, I'm also a part of like uh, the Ginsburg Center at University of Michigan, which is a, a place that does community engaged scholarship and so like right now I'm still learning the skills kind of required to to figure out how to do that. But like, yeah, I'm trying to secure first just a job and say the words that I know people want to hear from me before I like do something real. Um, but that's kind of where I'm at. Thanks for asking. Um, as for me, um, this is part of a larger uh, thesis that is about food justice, disability justice, and harm reduction. Um, so it's incorporating an analysis that talks about um, folks who use drugs and particularly injection drugs um, and how disability justice, food justice, and harm reduction all kind of leave each other out of their analysis and also their tenets can be used to kind of fill those gaps in each other um, and proposing a integrated model. Um, it's hard stuff. Not this is not a lot of overlap in scholarship, so it's it's really trying to get deeply familiar with three areas and not so doable for a fifteen minute conference presentation. Um, in terms of where I want it to go, um, I kind of like I mentioned in my thing, I'm hoping to to get this work out of the academy and into action um, in movements um, and particularly like. Yeah, like I just want to make sure that like disabled drug users have food and like are thought about in making sure that people have food. That's really important to me. Um, the other question, yeah, I, I kind of answered that. Um, I'm also an artist and I'm incorporating artwork into that. I have a harm reduction themed coloring book um, that I use like to fund some harm reduction and disability justice stuff I'm involved in um, and hope to keep making art to support that work. Um, both academia and art are not the most well-paying areas, but they are the ones that make my heart happy. So we do our best and I can put a link to the coloring book. Yeah, thanks. It's a really good question. Uh, so the podcast itself, oh my gosh, I am hoping that we can launch in late May because I need to like off board off the fellowship. Like it was only supposed to last the academic year, but I kind of like agreed to stay on and like see it through because our community partners um, took a long time to agree to do these field interviews. And that was just the reality of it. Um, so, you know, you can already subscribe to public trust on apple podcasts or wherever you listen no i think it's like apple spotify and google we're on right now i'm working on getting us on the other platforms there's a trailer so you can that like it's there so you can like um hear a little bit about it and subscribe um if you're interested uh, we should have our first episode going out at the end of the month and so that's one way to share out i think something that you can think about in terms of sharing your work is to like, yeah, befriend the journalists and the comms teams and like other people working in these communicative spaces. And that's not to, as we've been saying with like activists and people like quote on the ground, it's not to glorify that, you know, they all have like better methods than we do or, you know, whatever, but it's just, it's, you know, that you can really kind of mobilize all of this energy around your projects and they're experts at communicating it out. So I really just like recommend like, yeah, be befriend a journalist, like befriend the comms team, like do what you can. Um, and they'll help you like publicize your work and maybe even translate it for, for different audiences. Um, and so you can be mindful of that. For me personally, this actually has like nothing to do with my dissertation, um, <laughs> which is like a critical analysis of Ikea, the Swedish furniture store um, and like the dystopian hellscape. So it's like, that's a lot of fun on its own. And I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm actually right now negotiating um, like different job offers and like different opportunities. And so I'm kind of like, yeah, doing that maneuver of like saying the things I need to say and doing the things I need to do to move ahead. Um, 
but yeah, I don't, I think maybe like next up for me, once I've like settled into something it is to learn how to like write a grant and execute a project that's for me and based on my research. And that's not for essentially like a professor or a client and doing the comms for their research, if that makes any sense. So that'll be like, just kind of a personal thing that I'm working on, but yeah, PFAS podcast called public trust. That's like where you can support and hear, and hear the stories, which I'll be honest, um, one, I guess is one last note about doing this project. It was way more exhausting and emotionally draining than I could have like ever prepared for. Like going into these communities and hearing these stories, I was, um, it was like exhausting. And I basically would like have to take a couple days to, to sort of recover. And I think that that's really common and familiar for people who have actually been working in social sciences and working with communities, but I was new to it. I was baby little humanist who writes about literature usually. So, um, you know, it's just like, remembering everyone's human. I think this conference has done an amazing job already of keeping that um, in the forefront. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, all of you. And um, yeah, that last that last thing that really made my little heart very happy. <laughs> and um, I'm gonna go ahead and close out since we are a little bit over time. Um, and then I will hopefully see you all again tomorrow morning. Um, bright and early, depending on what time zone you're in, maybe after lunch, if you're in a different part of the country or world. Um, and I look forward to seeing you then. And I'll do a little Zoom wave and say goodbye. Thank you.